You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. You can make this possible. All right, folks, a new strain of coronavirus that has become dominant around the world appears to be more contagious than the previous versions has been recently identified by scientists. This new strain first appeared in Europe in February and quickly migrated to the East Coast in the United States. In a new study, scientists wrote that this strain has been dominant around the world since mid-March. This strain may make people vulnerable to a second infection. Man. Uh, joining us right now, Joseph Graves, professor of biological sciences at North Carolina A&T. Uh, Doc, you were on here um, a bit ago, a few weeks ago, and you said other strains are being developed and that we have to understand that there might be one strain, but this thing can mutate and we're just sort of just chasing, chasing after it as it keeps mutating. Yeah, uh, Rowan, yeah, again, I, I hate it when I'm right about things like this, but people in my field have been predicting for some time that as the, the virus infects more individuals, it's going to accumulate more mutations. New strains are going to evolve. And there's always going to be a trade-off between two aspects of what the virus does. One thing the virus does is it replicates many copies and it makes the host sick. That's what we call virulence. The other thing it has to do is it has to be able to transmit to another host. And that's what we call transmission. Those two things always trade off against each other. And generally, what you see through the course of an epidemic is a reduction in virulence, meaning how badly they make people sick, but an increase in transmissibility. And, and those two tend to um, equilibrate. In other words, they, they're always working against each other. In the 1918 pandemic, the first wave was not as transmissible, nor was it as virulent. But the second wave actually had both of those things. It was extremely transmissible and it was highly virulent. And that's the strain that killed most of the people um, in, in that pandemic, which eventually petered out at approximately 100 million people worldwide. So here you have them talking about opening up states. We still have not had widespread testing. Uh, and so now with these with this new strain, we're just truly operating in the blind. Again, I couldn't agree with the congressman who was on uh, a few minutes ago about how you cannot reopen the economy without widespread testing and contract tracing, contact tracing. It's absolutely an insane proposition um, to be trying to open the economy now with the infrastructure we have to deal with infectious disease. Um, and the worst part of it is, again, political leadership in this country, particularly out of the White House, is continuing to reinforce the idea that this is not a serious issue. Um, when you have the vice president going to a hospital not wearing a mask with people who are vulnerable to infection or disease, you send a message to people about how much you really think about what their lives are worth. And unfortunately, the, again, the White House has been involved in divisive, destructive rhetoric, which is going to cost more and more American lives. So moving forward, what do we do? I mean, how do we, how do we prepare for this, knowing full well with these different strains? And so what do you tell the average person out there who might be coming back into the, to the workplace? Now we're talking about public transportation, restaurants, what do we do? You have to assume that everybody's infected, in, including yourself. And so therefore, the individual has to take steps to make sure that they don't make someone else sick. And, that it, and that's going to involve more and more um, people wearing masks in public. It's going to involve changing the way we're going to be in public with regard to physical space. Um, it's going to involve um, constant hand washing cleaning of surfaces, all of these things are going to now going to be the new normal with regard to how we behave. Because as I've again said on the show, 
This pandemic is the first of many to come. Unless we change the way we live, and, I, and quite frankly, I don't see that happening um, in the near future, we're going to be seeing pandemic after pandemic after pandemic. So instead of hoping that these disasters aren't going to happen, we really need to change our thinking as a society, and particularly, again, political leadership is going to play a crucial role in terms of preparing the infrastructure to defend critical portions of the economy, such as workers who work to bring food to people's table, you know, workers who work to keep the lights on and the heat on and to pick up the garbage. All of these things need to be done with an understanding that from now on, dangerous infectious disease is always going to be something that we're going to have to deal with as a society. So I'll ask you this. So you say we're going to have to deal with pandemic after pandemic after pandemic based upon the way we're living. Why? What was so what exactly about how we're living that's going to drive that? Okay, one of the biggest problems we have is our population density. So you'll notice that when you look at the United States, the hot spots are in the biggest urban areas. And so when you have that many people close to each other, and particularly um, congregating in public spaces, riding on public transportation, um, that's uh, basically a, a, a smorgasbord for viruses and bacteria to be able to infect more and more people. So what do we do? I think the Skype freeze. Okay, so let me know when we get Doc back. I uh, want to bring my panel in. Uh, that certainly um, is not um, something that we really want to hear, Brooke. I don't know if, again, our leaders are properly preparing people for how life is about to be for us now in the future. No, because too many of them right now are preparing people to go back to normal, even though not only do we not have a vaccine, we don't have adequate testing, but we still don't know much about this virus whatsoever. Um, and everyone right now seems to be, even the, the mayors and governors who've been like killing it are all, I've noticed, like really focused on how do we go back to normal before we even have any full understanding of this, before we get any real control over this. We just have more hospital beds now. And so it's like, all right, that's the best we can do. This has all been frustrating and, and it's scary. Um, but, and see what you're dealing with when you have people, Malik, say, liberate Michigan, liberate Wisconsin. There's people protesting in Massachusetts. And well, oh, this, is just, this is just a hoax, whatever. Uh, this, that's 71,000 number. Then you see the report. But the White House is now trying to downplay where it could be even higher. Now Trump is trying to move his number. Remember, it was it was, you know, 30, then 50, then 60, then 65, then 70. Now he's now he's talking about 100. Hey, if as as Governor Andrew Cuomo said, if you don't change how you operate, you're not going to get the numbers under control. I think you you made the point a few weeks back when you were talking about what the president himself is ultimately responsible for the we have we're having conversations about opening up the government or you know, the economy and the reality is is that this is a decision that has been left up to the states the states are controlling when they decide to open themselves back up what's happening is is that there are a lot of there's a lot of information that's going back and forth um, and, and some some of it obviously is in the media but I think what the, the challenge moving forward, as we're seeing is, and we had the conversations about how to protect the, the, um, the workforce. So I actually think that the congressman, I think that OSHA should get involved. I think there should be some sort of federal standard um, as far as worker protection. OSHA is the agency. If you want to protect workers against um, you know, blood-borne pathogens or exposure to lead or even our fall protection standards for people who do businesses, um, you know, build buildings and things like that, that's where OSHA can get involved. So I think from a federal level, that's something definitely that the, well, I think it's a good idea for Congress to actually focus on that. I'm not sure if the administration, maybe, maybe some sort of directive 
initiative. I don't, and maybe that's something that they can do. But this is something that needs to be memorialized in law because, as everyone has been saying, this is this is going to be around us for a very long time. So as far as protecting workers, I think that we're on to something as far as trying to get OSHA to change some of those regulations to address it. Before I go to Kelly, I want to bring in uh, Dr. Graves back. We've got his Skype taken care of. So, Doc, we, we talked about, again, how we have to change. Um, um, so, so what should be our MO moving forward, you know, in terms of how we're operating every day? Well, I, I think there needs to be fundamental changes to, to how we live. Um, and that's really going to require making fundamental um, or asking fundamental questions about what kind of society we want to live in. Um, the idea of having you know populations concentrated um, in such small areas is something I think we really need to revisit. But to be able to do that, you also have to start thinking about, well, how are you going to produced the basic needs of life um, so that instead of having all of the means by which that production happens concentrated in small areas, um, we, we need to, to think about how we can do these things in a decentralized way. Now, one of the good things that would come out of that sort of decentralization is that would also require us having a bigger labor force. And that means people who have been chronically and, and as many economists would call structurally unemployed, would have to be brought back into the labor force if you're going to do things in a decentralized way, and particularly things like growing food, processing food, doesn't have to be done all in one place. So in fact, I was on a call with some colleagues um, who are researchers in, in microbial evolution and, and viral disease, and we were all talking about the fact that unless we make these fundamental structural changes in how we're living, then the pandemic is going to be the new normal. At the Graves, I certainly appreciate it, man. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kelly, I don't think that leadership is prepared to actually do this. And I believe that that is a shame. And the crazy thing is, if Trump actually had enough sense, which he has none, enough sense to do this, actually people respond that way. But as long as he keeps burying his head in the sand on this whole deal, and he's only fixated with the economy without understanding all of this impacts the economy. You can't get what you lost unless you prepare people for life moving forward. Not only can you not do that, you can't have a functioning economy without a consumer. Consumers are people. You cannot consume anything unless you're if you're dead. So if if we do not get a handle on this virus and viruses to come, because that's what viruses do. Once we get a vaccine, the virus responds, it'll mutate and so on and so forth. We have to keep responding to this. We should have been on a proactive tip regarding this particular uh, novel coronavirus because we had enough information ahead of time in order to get ahead of the ball on it. But like you said, we have a president who is inept and who kept his head in the sand regarding these issues, actually fired the people who could sooner do something about it. And now we are where we are because of this ineptitude. But like I was saying previously, we need to have... A, a structure such that the economy is not the priority. People need to be the priority. Profit can't happen without people. Money can't be spent without people. The economy is non-existent without people. And right now, people are dying. So if we can't get a handle on this, nothing else matters. So we need to, we need to really shift our focus to people. We need to shift our perspective on this issue and have a more humane response as opposed to something that is strictly or predominantly economic based. Every single night. We've got some of the top black experts. You're not going to see them on cable news or broadcast news because you swear black people aren't experts when it comes to this health crisis. 
That's why we have this show and why we do what we do every day on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Joining us right now is retired General Russell Honoré. Uh, thanks for the Black Surgeon General, Dr. Jocelyn Elders. John Hope Bryan, he is the founder of Operation Hope. Senator Kamala Harris of California. Dr. Sadrina Calder, retired General Lloyd Austin. Congresswoman Karen Bass, Commissioner Omari Hardick. Bureau President in Brooklyn, Eric Adams. Dr. Joseph Graves, America's Wealth Coach, Deborah Owens. So Dr. Corey A. Bear, a towel salt. Uh, Howard University student, Pastor Jamal Bryant, a uh, doctor, uh, Christy McDowell, Benja Ajilore, senior economist at the Center for American Progress, Gilda Daniels, again, author of the book, The Crisis of Voter Suppression in America. Four stars, uh, General Kip Ward, Dr. Oliver Brooks, is president of the National Medical Association, president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Patrice Harris, Joby Benjamin, Dr. Alexia Gaffney, infectious disease specialist, Dr. George Benjamin, uh, executive director of the American, American Public Health Association, Malcolm Nance, family medicine physician Dr. Jen Caudill, Dr. Tashaka Cunningham, a molecular biologist, Kat Stafford. She's a national race and ethnicity reporter for the Associated Press. Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, uh, who is the president of Howard University, Congresswoman Yvette Clark uh, from the state of New York, William Spring, AFL-CIO economist, uh, Andrea James, executive director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. All right, let's go to Capitol Hill. Congressman Gregory Meeks, Congresswoman Anne Johnson of Texas, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Minnesota Senior. Amy Klobuchar, mental health clinician, Jamie Singletary, Prince George's County State's Attorney, Aisha Brayboy, as well as Dylan uh, Harry, ACLU Justice Division strategist. Uh, Dr. Cindy Duke, uh, she's a virologist, Principal Steve Perry of Capital Prep. Health and wellness specialist, Dr. Yolandra Hancock, Desmond Mead, President of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, Cliff Albright, who is the co-founder of Black Voters Matter, Michael Harriet with the group, the Mina McWhorter, founder of Love by the Hand, Dr. Julian Malvo, economist, president, Merida Bennett College. Corner Michael Fowler is the mayor of Atlanta. Keisha Lance Bottoms, mental health therapist Suzette Clark. Justin Gibney, attorney and political strategist, and Bishop Vincent Matthews Jr. Dr. Suzette McKinney, CEO and executive director of the Illinois Medical District. Dr. Leon Madugo, president elect of the National Medical Association. Jana Bailey, mayor of Moss Point, uh, Mississippi. Uh, Mario King. We're going to keep driving this thing to make sure our people are fully aware, safe, protected from coronavirus. You get the top medical experts, the top business experts, top political experts, top religious experts, because that's why we do what we do, unapologetically and unfiltered. Ain't nobody else in the black media space doing what we do. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.